Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fulton Land Live. We are going to be having some fun today as we're looking at what makes great superhero teams in comics, in film, TV, what have you. Uh, we'll be looking at some comic book art today. Russ and I both have some storylines and some characters and some teams that we grew up on and had a big influence into our ideas about what makes great superhero storytelling. So we're going to have some fun uh, looking forward to you guys in the chat, chiming in and letting us know if there are superhero teams that you guys like, and in particular, what makes those teams great. So before we go any further, I just want to welcome everybody in the chat. Skip Edwards, Darren Wagner, Mo Biggs. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining. Uh, Dojo Kuhn and Insaniacs Draw. Insaniacs Draws. Good to see you. George Travlos. Good morning, George. Are you recovered yet from that epic live stream closing out Ken Rocafort's Groken campaign? That what was a campaign. What oh, a campaign. man. Great, great project, great campaign, and a marathon of a closeout on that last day. That was so much fun. I, I listened to all but about an hour of it because I had to co-host Michael Bancroft's show. Uh, and then after the Bancroft show was over, I went back to lurking in the uh, chat for... Uh, Leroy's show where they were doing the closeout and I was working and just listening to the show and it was it was fantastic so much fun so if anybody in the chat has not seen that I highly recommend you check out uh, Leroy's channel and you look at the Leroy if you have a link to that feel free to put that in the chat and you guys, you, I don't expect anybody to listen to the whole seven and a half hours, but if you want to, uh, maybe put it on 1.5 speed or something like that while you're doing your chores or running errands. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And there were quite a few people who were in and out of the panel, and we had a really good time. So uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Von Stugel, good to see you, sir. Von Stugel. And <laughs> George, he said it took him two days to recover from that stream, but he's all better. <laughs> you were a champ, George. I, I, you, I got to say, you were the MVP of that stream. For a guy who normally goes to bed at 8 p.m. and you were up, I don't even know how late, to 2 a.m., 3 a.m.? Yeah, it was 3 a.m., wasn't it, when the stream ended? Um, so... <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyway, um, George had a great April Fool's joke here. Here we go. Great superhero team. So not the X-Men. That is my favorite April Fool's Day statement of the day so far. Kicking it off great. Glad to see you celebrating in style, George. <laughs> we, we all know that the X-Men are, f well, at least they were fantastic back in the day. Uh, Matthew Fowler, good to see you, sir. Thanks for joining the show. And uh, let's get this let's get this party started. So, Russ, um, you and I were talking the other day about different zero superhero teams that mm -hmm. we both grew up reading, and some of our favorites. Uh, what do you What do you bring into the table today? Um, I, I have three. I have three teams, uh, none of them particularly original. Um, oh, well, but then, okay. But then what is, I, 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 I like the Defenders uh, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I like the, the Sal Boosmer artwork well, was a big thing. Um, also, it always seemed like it was, it definitely was like the, uh, the B team. It wasn't mm -hmm. the Avengers. And I yeah. liked it because of that. I liked it because it had really odd uh, characters in it. it kind of had like amazing characters that they couldn't quite sneak into the Avengers and they mm -hmm. had their own team in the defenders 
And uh, although several of them actually turned up in the Avengers, obviously. Um, but uh, I don't know. It just, I, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, I did enjoy the Avengers as well. You know, that's not very original, but it was a big thing for me. Uh, but probably the the art was what drew me most. And for, for that, I, I went back to Fantastic Four, which mm -hmm. is... It's not technically a team because they're a family, um, but uh, it was the art. So I, I just I snuck that one in I, because because of John Buscema's run on it, basically, and it, more importantly, uh, Joe Sinnott's inks over a, a huge span of time uh, and how he kept it all looking so damn good. Well, I would ar argue that the Fantastic Four is a team, um, not just because there are multiple people involved, but there were times throughout the FF's history where there was a team member who was unavailable for whatever reason, and they would bring in another, like a reserve member or oh yeah, they had plenty a, of a, subs, a yeah. fill in. So like when right. John Byrne took over the title, he sent the thing off on extended hiatus, and he brought in She Hulk. Yeah, and I remember as a kid, at first I was disappointed, even though I liked She Hulk, uh, but I just loved the thing, and I wanted mm. him to be in my ff comics and so at first i was disappointed but then i came to really appreciate the new dynamic and and the different style of humor that uh burn was able to bring in through the character mm. of she hulk who i loved as his version as a solo character i loved her her solo series when burn was writing and drawing it and and there were times where spider-man would come in you know like as a substitute for johnny storm or uh what have you so that's i i say that's a great pick uh what's your third one that was my third one so i had avenge i had oh, defenders oh, defenders then avengers, avengers. Okay. so i've got and some then... art i've got some art here okay yeah let's show it so that's that's an old um these are very old covers um and some defend they're not in order unfortunately some the, just the defenders covers i i have a feeling just the way this looks it looks like they might have gil kane underneath it and somebody else has inked Gil Kane out of it. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, mm. And uh, just the characters they had, they could, they could just, you could put them in any of the situations it, it, because they were so janky, you know? They were, mm -hmm. they were just so odd together. I mean, the Hulk and, yeah. and Doctor Strange in, in the same room, that's just stupid. I don't um, know if you had the same impression I did when I was a kid, but I got the impression that when the Hulk had been naughty, he kind of got demoted to the defender yeah, yeah, until so he could he could prove that he could play nice, and then they'd bring him back on to the the, Avengers, the main yeah. squad for the adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and and the way that Hulk was really quite it, he was he was written quite differently for the team books than he was yeah. in his own book. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I just this this stuff here. This is what I was picking up, sort of early eighties. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the mid '80s, and um, that would, that's that's more '70s stuff. I've actually got some of those covers. I'll, I've got some to the left of me here. Mm -hmm. This this particular image made me fall in love with uh, Scarlet Witch when I was uh, a very young man. <laughs> I, I can see why. <laughs> it's just like the, the art's just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And then uh, Valkyrie, uh, who was kind of second on my list. Um, that looks like Gil Kane, actually. Does I can't tell for sure. Uh, and this this is some stunning art from um, John Buscema mm -hmm. on Fantastic Four. I think he inked this himself, actually. Uh, whereas this stuff is all um, from the mid run um, and his time after Kirby, um, and this is all done by Joe Sinnott. Uh, the, this kind of stuff is is where I, I this is my benchmark. It's like this is what I'm aiming for. Not that I'll ever get there, but uh, it's it's. I think it's a lofty height to to aim for. I love the clarity of the work. Yeah, uh, it's brilliant storytelling. Even though that we want to do lots of uh, panel, you know, extra panel stuff, and you know, uh, we like to like mix it up a bit and making mm -hmm. it uh, making it uh, fun. Um, this old six panel grid, this stuff, which is yeah. what I did uh, only death can save us in. Uh, I think it, it, it really, uh, lays the artist bare 
and you have to tell stories because the, the panels aren't going to help you. Right. It's, it's the content that tells the story. And if you don't get it right, you've got no help from the layout whatsoever. Uh, so, um, I, I, you know, it's quite a harsh way to, to go, but this was the way that the masters did it, you know, back in the day, obviously, you know, Boosima went on all, both, all, all of the, the, uh, bronze age artists moved on and, mm -hmm. and came up with more, um, more design in their layouts and came up with, with more imaginative ways of telling stories. Yeah. But this is where they cut their teeth. This shows you just how damn good they are at telling a story without mm -hmm. anything fancy involved. And still, even though this is only a six panel grid, that is the most incredibly exciting page. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be amazing design. Just, just the way that the panels work. Those yeah, panels. I I remember as a kid when I would read stuff like this and it, it didn't even occur to me to think about stuff like panel design. I was no. all about the art that was within the panel borders. So mm. I didn't care what the shapes of the panels were or how many were no. on the page. I was fully immersed in yeah. the story that was being told through images and words. It totally sucked you in. Um, mm -hmm. And look, if you just look at Agatha Harkness's face up, up on the top there, uh, the amount of lighting mm -hmm. that is in uh, that is uh, communicated by the inks, by Cynix inks, and and also obviously by by where John Buscema lay down the the basic pencils, and yet how much ink is actually on there. Yeah, statistical zero. Thanks for joining the show, Stato. Good to see you. He says there wasn't an ounce of wasted space on these pages. That's the trick. And do you know what the clever bit is? Is even the white wasn't wasted space. Yeah. Point. They used yep. everything. They understood how to communicate a story. It wasn't about producing the finest art in the world. It was mm -hmm. about producing a solid story. It just happened to create the finest art in the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when you're when you're having to crank out multiple books every month, you know, the way that somebody like the Buscema brothers did or Jack mm. Kirby did, or, um, you know, if you're an inker and, you know, like Senate and you have to move fast, it's a really intelligent design choice to use that negative space. Mm. And, you know, you talk about the lighting on Agatha Harkness's face and, you know, obviously that explosion, the center of that explosion is where that light is coming from. Mm. And look at how efficient <laughs> the the line work is where you're showing this massive explosion, but, yeah. you know, the power and, and the light that is really lighting her face up, that's negative, almost exclusively negative space. Yeah, it's it's economy of line as well. There's, there's no requirement to put extra bits in. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. Brit, Dave, me babbers. Hello. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Dave. That's uh, that's very nice of you. But yeah, this uh, it it's just it's so classy. So, and he wasn't just an inker. No, George. He he was a, he is or was a fantastic artist. Mm -hmm. um, but and a lot of the time he would get quite loose pencils. And it didn't matter who he got the pencils from; it would mm -hmm. always look spectacular by the time it went out to print. Yeah, uh, the the guy was amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I was shocked the first time. Actually, occasionally, I still am shocked when I come across a comparison where you have uh, somebody like a Jack Kirby or a, a John Buscema, how loose their pencil breakdowns are. And then you look at Sinnott's finished ink work over it, and it's stunning. And and you and I, you know, I have to remind myself, Sinnott is having to move as fast as those pencilers were. Yeah, because yeah. he's got to get his pages, you know, off to the production office so that they can do. I mean, they most likely would have been lettered before he got the pages, because so, he had to mm. ink the 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 art and then he had to ink the letters and then he had to send it off to the production office so they could do the the colors but you know man in, in all of my years of 
reading and studying comic book history, I've never heard anyone uh, have a bad thing to say about Senate making deadlines, even on team books where you just have, you know, everything and the kitchen sink that he has to draw every single week. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the the guy was a master. And in in actual fact, it was Joe Sinnott that was keeping Marvel together for the most part, not the pencilers. Um, but, and he doesn't really get the credit for it, I don't think, uh, because obviously he's he is inking over spectacular pencilers. Um, but uh, he he gave. I mean, I I have uh, five five of these essential books. For, sorry, three three of these essential books in a row. And you mm-hmm. see how thick they are. All yeah. of them by Sinnott, and it just—it didn't matter who the who the artist was underneath it. He managed to make it look, give it that sort of silky smooth presentation. Um, mm-hmm. In actual fact, I would say that after he inked John Buscema, where you had other people, where he was inking other people, there was a Buscema um, effect. And it's, it's almost like he kept on drawing faces in the way that Busima did, even yeah. though the other pencilers were on the, it, were, were, were doing the, the stuff underneath. So right. um, it, it just gave a, an amazing look for such a long time. Yeah, I, I agree. And George, uh, you're absolutely welcome. George says, my eyes are getting misty. Thank you both for teaching everyone about Joe Sennett. I uh, uh, absolutely idolize the guy. Uh, he's... Yeah, he, yes. he he's he's one of the the legends that so many others are influenced by and he's one mm-hmm. of those guys who like Kirby and Busema where their influence is so pronounced upon comic book history that you'll have uh artists who learned under them and then they carry the influence of Sinnet in their work and then other people under those artists get that influence. It's like a multi-generational influence. So now that we've successfully put Leroy to sleep, uh, let's let's move on to, uh, do you want to look at some Avengers work? or? Yeah. Uh, well, you, you, you shoot whatever you've got. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Well, I'm going to start. Sorry, sorry for putting you to sleep, Leroy. Oh, uh, that's all right. He's probably still recovering from uh, that closeout stream. He was, broken. he was, uh, he bought my, a copy of my book last week. So, uh, <laughs> or, was, or was it the week before? He actually got the copy. So he's, yeah, he's, he, I was, oh, uh, well, I, I got it. Very, he was very um, polite and nice about it. Very uh, complimentary. Thank you very much, Leroy. Yeah, well, he he sincerely said that it's his favorite book of the year, and he yeah. was phenomenally um, complimentary about it oh, when we you. were we were talking about it. He told us that he got it, he read it, and he was really really impressed with your storytelling, both visually uh, and the the writing of the relationship between d uh, otherwise known as death yeah (laughs) and uh and his his uh young sidekick who goes through quite a uh a a character arc in that Mm. first book yeah well the it the the end of the third book um if you thought the end of the first one was a shocker the end of the third book is gonna throw you off your off your chair so there you go Nice. Just, just a a, a a show, something that's coming up. So, um, the the plan is to have because uh, I'll be working on outliers with you for, mm-hmm. up until sort of end of June. Although I would imagine it will spill over beyond that, because um, that's always the way of things. Uh, that, at which point I start in, in earnest on uh, Only Death Can Save Us Two, uh, mm-hmm. and that's I'm actually going to go into back to back production. With, oh wow! With the third book, so that I can get round to you in the new year. <laughs> and so that we can hopefully carry on with outliers straight again. So, nice. Uh, yeah. That's good to hear, man. I, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to people, um, <clears throat> being able to see, uh, I mean, cause they got to see in only death can save us. They saw your tribute to mm. the earlier years of the bronze age 
in the style that you chose to draw that book in. And then in the next only death book, you're going to be drawing in a style that's more reminiscent of the later half of the bronze yeah. age. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, it's certainly the layouts will be more in that direction because that's mm -hmm. something we spoke about is that it, just coincidentally, it, it, I'm going to be drawing it in the same way as I'm doing outliers. Uh, so it's it's just upping the the uh, tempo with the layouts and just uh, doing something a little bit different with it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, that's where that's, we're going. That's cool. And then with the outliers, it's definitely heavily inspired by the Bronze Age, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got um, really a fusion. I like to think of it between Bronze Age storytelling and artwork and the um some of the more modern sensibilities certainly modern technology because you're drawing the book digitally uh, and then you're inking it traditionally so i i think we're coming up with a nice um visual uh there for for readers yeah yeah that's the, and that's the that's the uh point yeah if you look at um no i haven't mentioned indie vault revolt uh, funnily enough, on Indie Vault, I was on uh, Indie Vault earlier with Varian, and um, there were some questions came in about uh, about Comics Gate and stuff like that. And, oh, not uh, those, not those deplorables. Not those deplorables. And uh, we all had a, a solid conversation. In fact, the solid response was, "Shut the fuck up, will you?" <laughs> um, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. That's okay. Excuse me. Sorry. 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 That's all right. Sorry. That's all right. Yes, Shut as to turn it down stfu um <laughs> and no but, but sorry I, I i for my outburst there but it, it was it, it really was that way it was it, it was like oh God, come on just stop it everybody just get mm -hmm. on and make comics and stop uh you know sort of baiting people and just get on with it just get yeah. on you know and 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 also you know just just talk to people open yourself up uh, what, what I have seen recently, because uh, I don't want to rush off uh, into another topic, uh, but what I have seen is lots of different people sharing both Kickstarter and Indiegogo, mm -hmm. and I think that's a really good thing. People need to get back to making comics and, and stop mm -hmm. being silly. Uh, anyway, that that Indie Vault are great. Go over to Indie Vault and and watch uh, some of the Indie Vault um, programs. I'm on there with with Randy over at Arrow Comics quite a bit. And it's it's just really, really cool. Anyway, the Indie Vault Revolt is 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 a book that's being run by um Randy uh, over at Arrow Comics and it's on Indiegogo at the moment. And uh it's just got lots of different creators in it. So it's black and white and it's lots of different creators. And I've got an ulterior motive because there is a backup story in there from Only Death Can Save Us about war. And it's uh, mm. it's it's a good fun fight scene in a bar, so it's good. It's 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 worth a little read, uh, and that will end up um, turning up in in the uh, in the books that, mm -hmm. that I'll be obviously crowdfunding. Um, it, those backup stories will, will be nowhere else but in those books, and they will be in color in those books as well. And I might even find somebody special to color them. But yeah, nice. if you fancy, if you fancy a nice big book, and the other thing about this book is it's a hark harken back to the old days. It's got two covers, so I've got a cover, and then there's another cover. So they've got four covers, but it's only two books. So it's a, it's a flip book, so you can go in sixty pages and then flip it over, and then go in sixty pages. So it's got a cover on both. It's got the cover and the back cover are both covers. You just flip mm -hmm. it over and then go back in. Uh, so that's quite neat. Um, so yeah, go check them out. This uh, they're, they're they're really cool over at Indie Vault and um, check out Liberty uh, Distribution as well. If you want to, you know, you're doing. We're obviously, we're all crowdfunding here and we're getting our books out. Um, but uh, there's there, there is an audience out there that will never turn up to crowdfunding. So you know, if you want to put mm -hmm. your book, uh, get them reprinted. Um, you know, as, as, as EVS has said, you know, like the crowdfunding book is the, is the premiere. It's the place where you come to get the piece of, of, of content from the, the creator, the, the, you know, the, the luxury item. Um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the, the network release as it were is, is out there in the, in, in the direct market. If you want it to go out there, if you want to put your books out there, try out Liberty, uh, distribution cause they do, it's all indie books. It's all indie books, so give them a go. But yeah, nice. 
yeah, give uh, give Indie Vault Revolt a look on Indiegogo and um, pick one up. It's quite cheap, and they've already passed their uh, their target. So yeah, cool. So that that advert out of the way for Indie Vault and for the Revolt book. Let's get back. That's <laughs> an after my apology for my outburst. Um, oh, let, that's uh, that's that's quite all right. We're we're still in back. the <clears throat> yeah we're still in the early stages of of turning into this show into a, a professional production. We're still <laughs> we're still uh, we're still working out some of the wrinkles. No problem. Um, I have to get a little hooter. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Mo was joking that, that my f- three favorite teams are X-Men, X-Force, and the New Mutants, <laughs> which I'm sure is meant purely to antagonize Leroy and George because they are not X-Men fans. Um, to which George replies, that's worse than Eric Weathers' taste in sandwiches. Mm, Shots s- fired. Sandwiches, sandwiches. To which Eric Weathers rep- replies, how dare you? Uh, so, oh, good, George. He can excuse one of them. So that gives me <laughs> a little bit of, of leeway. Oh, you got some wiggle room. Um, and welcome, Woodrow. Uh, thanks for joining the show. And Eric McIntyre, Eric Weathers. It's an invasion of Eric's. Very Eric's. good. That Eric's. And Genuine Comics. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining. So let's go with... We'll start off with the new Teen Titans. Round of applause. The 1980 version with George Perez and Marv Wolfman. And George Perez. Oh. I just think that George Perez was one of the best artists at drawing team books. And one of the reasons, and one of the reasons why I've always liked superhero teams in addition to solo characters. I mean, let's see. He just knows how to place figures, doesn't he? He's yeah, I a... mean, just look at this composition. You've got this giant monster... And so he's got one of the team members in serious trouble, Cyborg. He's got Changeling up there, who was Beast Boy, and then changed his name to Changeling for uh, for this run. Uh, you've got him up there trying to help. Robin is swinging in, not really doing much of anything. Uh, Starfire flying in. I mean, so you got all these different characters in different poses, doing different things. And then you've got this little prologue page where, again, you've got the entire team there, hmm. and they're all coming in, and they just look like they mean business. That's a, that's a sexy costume on Cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> he's showing off some skin. Well, he's showing off a lot more skin than that girl next to him, so there you go. Yeah, he sure is. That's a sexual liberation for you. Yeah, 1980. He was all about the uh, revealing outfits. But uh, so one of the things that I like so much about the teen, the new Teen Titans during this time frame was that you had these many different personalities, and you had um, different character dynamics because of the different personalities. And so there was always stuff going on between two or more of the characters, which made for a varied uh, tone, you could say Mm. from book to book, storyline to storyline, and you could have different subplots going while you had the main plot for that particular issue. And I always liked how in team of books you could have multiple subplots going and you could emphasize one or the other depending on what was happening in the series um so for example in this one um this is when here was an issue where dr light shows up and he's giving starfire some problems there 
Now, so here's a the book uh, that issue happened to open up where they're just you know chilling out on the balcony. So good. Do you, you know. do you kind of uh, if you look quickly look at that starfire pose? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you recognize that pose? Uh, it looks familiar, but it's it, the reference is not coming to me. Uh, we had a conversation about it yesterday. Are you so, talking about the the cover Star, image? Starfire's pose on the cover image or on this other page? On, on the cover. On the cover. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Absolutely. <laughs> so that... yeah, to- totally different. Totally yeah. different uh, than what I was thinking. <laughs> I thought you meant sitting on the balcony. <laughs> no, no, on the cover. Yeah, we're actually going to show you guys uh, some artwork today from the Outliers. We're going to reveal a new character, and we're also going to show you the layout for page one of the book. And um, when we do that, I think you'll understand the Starfire reference that Russ was talking about. Although it doesn't look like that now. So, but, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the, those kind of the whole point being is that those kind of poses and those kind of approaches to anatomy and to action are kind of like they're, they're hard baked into all of those books. Right. And you, um, you've got, <laughs> George says Beast Boy got poisoned by licking too many envelopes in the comic books. True story. <laughs> Please tell me that that was from the seventies, George, and not, you know, three years ago. Um, so here's an example of this is a couple years later. This is from an issue that was published in 1982. So it would have been uh, a couple years after the books that I was showing. And here we've got Russ was talking about that six panel grid for the page layout on um, the the Avengers and the Fantastic Four um, artwork he was showing off. And here we've got Perez doing some really, for the time, some really unconventional and um, very different panel design where you got in this page over here, there's a bunch of stuff happening. I'm going to zoom in so people can get a little better look on it. But basically, there's this central circular panel, and then all around it, you get the different team members reacting to what's happening in that center panel. And I really like how different artists can take, you know, a scene where there's a whole lot of stuff going on and they can use interesting panel design to convey a lot of different things happening all at once. Did you ever read the New Teen Titans in the 80s, Russ? No, I wasn't really into it. I've, I've picked up a few reprints since then. But mm-hmm. um, no, it wasn't. I was more of a, a, a Marvel boy. Oh, okay. So I didn't pick up as much. I, I, I got some Superman, mostly Batman, it has to be said, but didn't everybody. Um, yeah. So that, that was really, you know, and, and a few odd things like Lobo and stuff like that. Um, but I didn't, I, I didn't really pick up the Teen Titans at the time. Yeah, it there was a time where it was outselling the Uncanny X Men for Marvel, wow. and it that was uh, on its way to being Marvel's best selling title yeah. uh, at the time. This would have been in the early eighties. Amazing Spider Man, I believe, was still outselling. The Uncanny X-Men, but then in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, Uncanny X-Men would overtake Spider-Man as being the number one selling title. And about that time is when creative teams, uh, well, at least the the uh, writer for New Teen Titans, Marv Wolfman, went on to, to other stuff. And um, the sales dipped a bit for New Teen Titans, so it came just below an Uncanny right. X-Men um overtook them in the sales but yeah it was an extraordinarily popular title in uh in the 80s um so i just wanted to check in with the chat here and see some of what they were saying about 
different um, different titles, different teams, uh, and Stato is appreciating how the colors looked. Yeah, this I, I really like these. Um, these are reprint collections for the Titans, and so uh, I think what they did is they probably digitally remastered the colors from the originals, but then they kept the same palette as close as possible. Uh, I think they actually replicated it accurately, and then they they just put it on newsprint and colored it the exact same style as the originals. So that that's my preferred method of reading uh, reading those books. Uh, welcome, Phil from Zade Comics. Glad you could join the show, and everybody else who's joined in the last few minutes. Uh, we appreciate it. Let's see. Just looking through to see. Jasper says he has the new Teen Titans Omnibus 1 and 2. And uh, have a good day, Darren. Um, yeah, Jasper's saying he likes the that same coloring style. Uh, Leroy wants to talk about Batman. Well, Leroy, enlighten us. Uh, Batman has been part of a few different teams over the years. Do you have a particular, and anyone else in the chat, do you have a particular favorite, whether it's Justice League or Brave and the Bold or Batman and the Outsiders or any other team he's been a part of? And while you think about that, I'm going to move on to... Uh, my next one here, and I'm gonna I, I'm gonna ease George and Leroy into this gently. We're gonna go from the New Teen Titans to the Uncanny X Men. Really, and I, I won't stay on the X Men for too long because I really do like those guys' company. I don't want them <laughs> to uh, leave the show, but I want to show this. Um, I've showed this once before, but this cover is one of the pieces of art that inspired me to create the Outliers universe because I l absolutely loved the idea of having all these superheroes uh, working together. And this is a crossover book from 1982, one of the DC and Marvel collaborations that I think went really, really well. And so this was a book that had an all-star production team on it, uh, written by Chris Claremont, penciled by Walt Simonson, finished, meaning inked, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, Walt Simonson did the layouts, and then Terry Austin did the finishes with the inks. Uh, Tom Orzakowski was a letterer. I'm sure Eric Weathers, if he's still in the chat, will appreciate that. Uh, he's my favorite letterer, personally. Uh, and then you had Glynis Ween, who was a colorist. She was a very prolific and very skilled colorist uh, that colored many, many legendary books from the, the 70s and 80s. Uh, you've got uh, Louise Simonson editing back before she married Walt. So her name was Louise Jones. Uh, Jim Shooter was the editor-in-chief of this particular collaboration. And then Len Wein, who was writing <sighs> the, uh, I mean, you know, co-created Wolverine and, and Swamp Thing and, and just an incredible legend. Uh, he was a contributing editor. So him and Shooter basically both oversaw this project. I'm not going to go into the details of it. What a monster of a project. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just, just phenomenal. Um, and I'll just show this one piece of artwork. You've got dark Phoenix and dark side. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> on the same page. Amazing. And then Orzakowski's lettering is just gorgeous. This one's for you, Eric Weathers. Uh, 
So let's see if Leroy has uh, talked about any any teams Batman was a part of, or if he's just all about finger sniffing this morning. <laughs> Uh, scrolling back up through the chat. Genuine Comic says, one team book he can read over and over is Mark Bagley's run on Thunderbolts. That's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting choice. Uh, never would have guessed that one. Uh, Matthew Fowler says he was a pretty big fan of the Dave Finch New Avengers team. And George said, is Batman and the Outsiders considered a team? I thought it was, but uh, <laughs> if if others disagree, then feel free to to school me on that. Uh, I guess you could say it's Batman and a bunch of sidekicks, but I to me it was always a team book. Uh, you're right, Jasper. They will never reprint. I, I don't can't imagine anyway uh, them ever reprinting that. Teen Titans and uh, Uncanny X Men crossover. Uh, Justice League Dark. Uh, someone looks like uh, Matt Fowler came up with. George with a controversial hot take believes Todd Klein is better than Tom Orzakowski. It's all right, George. We'll we'll allow it. We'll all disagree with it, but we'll allow it. <laughs> Um, and Statistical Zero is saying that Justice League America or International and New Frontier, that's a great call. Uh, New Frontier, still one of his favorite books. Oh, Eric. I can't believe it. <laughs> He's agreeing with George about Klein being better than Orzakowski. Oh, God, that's biblical. Wow. Dogs and cats living together. Mass then again, together. then again, Eric is a Twitch thought. So, you nah. know, I, I have to believe Twitch that it's, it's, it's starting to affect his judgment. It's my favorite kind of thought. <laughs> 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 and back to the comment about New Frontier, Jasper says that anything Darwin is solid gold. Yeah, Darwin Cook wrote and edited um, New Frontier. And that's that's one that I want to get in a collected edition. Um, uh, I've got very little spare change these days because so I'm pouring so much money into Outlier Comics and, and getting uh, Outliers Volume 1 produced. But at some point, I'm going to go back to um i guess shoring up my my uh my dc collections get some darwin cook in there um so since we gave, gave a little taste of the x-men i'm just gonna show one one little thing out of this uh, Uncanny X-Men Omnibus. And this Do is it. from... Do it. Yeah, this, oh, so this is... This is, this is from the Dark Phoenix Saga. And we've got... If I can get this thing on the camera. We've got the Watcher, who is... And this other one over here... So we got the Watcher here, and he's basically introducing us to this epic tale. And you got that cover. But now here's... Then you go from that to this. Look at that. You got a double-page spread. You only get this in team books. You know, you don't, you don't get this in a character with a solo title. You've got the entire team. They've got this, you know, huge world changing world shattering thing that's going on and we open up by trying to get a sense for what these characters are are going through mentally what they're about to go through uh physically and uh just stuff like that i i i never get tired of team books i know they're not for everybody some people like the solo ones better but i really like both 
and I just wanted to show some examples of. Um, I just. To... <laughs> <laughs> oh, George, that's got just some... my. Yeah, go, what's that? What's that, Russ? So I've got some. I've got some art to show. Uh huh. Oh, you got that up on there. So this is a page from Only Death Can Save Us. Just as a as an example of what we're talking about layouts. Yeah. Um, so you can see the layout here is a six panel grid. Very straightforward stuff. Mm -hmm. Um you can you can cut it up in lots of different ways. There's a there's more of a group shot going on there. So you can see stuff going on in the background. But you can cut it up into different ways, but it's all about telling the story through the panels. Yeah. Um, but it's it, it can be, if you're not careful, it can be uh, a little dull. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go back in time here uh, and show something that's a little bit older, but it's sort of a halfway house as far as layouts are concerned. So this is some Doctor Who stuff. Okay. So you can see here, the layouts are, are still fairly um, pedestrian. Mm. They're still they're still hanging around the grid, but there's some odd lines and lots of pop outs mm -hmm. to increase the uh, to to increase the visual stimulus of of the page. Yeah. So, and then if I stop that. And then go to something that's slightly more recent and nothing like it at all. But you'll be able to see an even more um, extreme layout. And that's on the Ben 10 stuff, which obviously is not like uh, the, the art that we're looking at. But if you actually look at the design of the layouts, yeah, they're a lot, they're a lot more. You know, that one was a bit more in your face. Um, and then this last one, go on a bit, something like this, which is mm -hmm. more, um, some of these, yeah, just, just a little bit more, uh, there's more, um, diagonal lines. There's more, uh, vertical panels and there's all kinds of stuff that can make the page, you know, you put things off to an angle and then have yep. the whole page set at a different angle. I mean, that, that's a, that's actually a, an old, that's, that's definitely a, a bronze age um, trope there of having that angling there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You, you go into more of an active panel design instead of yeah. a, a passive panel. Design. Exactly. Exactly. So you're doing, you kind of this, I mean, like I say, I'm, I'm totally in love with that whole uh, six, uh, panel grid because mm -hmm. I think it I think it drives the artist harder to tell yeah. a story. That's not to say that you lean on the back of your layout as a storyteller. You don't. Um, right. But but I I just as a purist I I like that. But that said, there is something nice to. I mean that that panel that page uh, you showed. Like Russ cut out for a minute there. Are you back? Am I back? Yep, I think you're back. Right, okay. um, <laughs> um, there's there's nothing wrong with you know letting the layout do some of the work for you. Uh, mm -hmm. That's me being anal about it <laughs> because I I like that layout. I like the way it drives a um, uh, the, the way it drives an artist to work. But you can really do a lot with layouts. I mean, somebody who who really did I think so much for that was Neil Adams. Yeah, um, and his work with layouts and I agree, with them. and I think he's he's an amazing benchmark as well for that. It was kind of like, um, here, here's the Bronze Age, and now let's upgrade it. Mm -hmm. Here's Bronze Age point one. Do you know what yeah. I mean? One, one point one, and and mm -hmm. that's what Neil Adams did. He just like added that extra zing to it. Um, here's a an older page. Uh, this hasn't been published yet, but again, a, a group shot. So you've got a whole bunch of stuff going on and making sure that your, your characters layer in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but at the same time, you don't have to draw everything in the background. So I use strike lines. I use the the, yeah. the, the classic lines, although they're not done particularly well. Um, I'd have preferred them done slightly differently to that. But I didn't know what I was as much what I was doing back then. Mm -hmm. So uh, so yeah. So just some different samples of of like the the approach to a page and the approach to telling a story, and and by taking all these things in. You can just make your storytelling that much better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what do you say we uh, leave the past for a few <laughs> minutes and move into the present? Yeah, let's and do it. Yeah. Let's let's show off a, a new outliers character. Okay. Let's um, share. So we've we've seen all of the. Uh, outliers. Oh, George is saying that was only two teams that I talked about. Yeah, we're we're really running out of time here, <laughs> but um, I, I will say that I I I do consider the Fantastic Four to be a team book, uh, and I loved uh, I loved certain uh, runs of that. Um, the. The, for me, the the New Teen Titans, the Wolfman and Perez run, and then the Burn and Claremont and Cockrum, Uncanny X Men. Though to me, those were the the gold standards from the big two, and mm -hmm. they're two of my personal favorites. I, I don't, I usually don't have like a single favorite or a, a single, you know, one to two favorites of, of anything with comics because there's so much there and I have so many mm -hmm. different interests, but uh, I would definitely say that new T Titans is up there. Uncanny X-Men for sure. Those two fantastic four uh, is one. And um, I, I, you know, I, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I'll go with the defenders as a, as a weird, uh, addition. I really did like that. Um, yeah, I think I, something we have to say something about Simonson's work on Fantastic Four. It, mm -hmm. Just just to say the words out loud. Uh, yeah, personally, I think it was the Thor run. Oh, me that, too. That, that did it. Um, yeah. That that's the run. That's just uh, amazing. Um, and in actual fact, if you look at Thor and his uh, and the the pantheon of gods around him, it's almost it's almost a team book. Yes, almost. Yeah, so uh, you know because there, there's so many characters involved. There were definitely uh, storylines with Thor and the Warriors Three mm. and Sif, and you know where they would go out, and they were a team for that oh, yeah. storyline, and they had camaraderie, and you had adventure and and drama and and action. I mean, you had it all. So I think mm. that's a great call. Well, for, from from my perspective, obviously, from Only Death Can Save Us, I wanted that pantheon of gods feel. So mm -hmm. we've got the story in the first three books. We've got an yeah. end to it, which is going to blow your socks off. And then four, five, six, which I have a plan for, mm -hmm. would end up being a team book. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> cool. we'll, we'll see where that goes. <laughs> what, what's, a, what's so much fun is to be involved I have my own project, but being, I feel very much embedded in the outliers with you, mm -hmm. Joe. Um, and it feels, although I know it's not my project, but it feels like my project. Um, so it, it's great to have something running. Uh, it, it's it's almost like um, it's like that dream you had of working at Marvel when you were a kid, you know? Yeah. And and getting put onto one book and then another, and or having a run on a book, and it's like it is a very cool thing to be involved with. Very very cool. So. Well, I love hearing that, man. I, I absolutely consider you uh, to be an integral part, a critical part, an irreplaceable part of uh, what I'm trying to do with Outlier Comics. And to have a collaborator like you taking the stuff that I've been working on for years now, uh, it'll be almost three years to the day. Uh, oh, I mean, we're in we're in April, and I started it in May of 2018. Oh, so right. <laughs> that that's when I started with the the concept of yeah. how do how do I take, you know, the the 
dynamic that Marvel and DC had of 80 years of legacy of their superhero universes. How do I bring that sense of fun and excitement and you know the characters as well as you know or you mm. you think you know them as well as you think you know your neighbors and you yeah. know you 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 at times when you're a kid you're reading these books you feel like you're living in those worlds and yeah you, you get know, taken away into them yeah yeah that's, and, and that's what was great about them yeah yeah exactly and so it, it it took me about three months of trying to figure out how do I take that sort of a legacy and design a universe that can be presented in that type of scope, mm. but, but don't take 80 years to tell the stories. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. And but so, but then we're both, we're both um, products of the stuff that we love. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the point. So in some ways there's kind of like that, that, if that's what you want to do, that's what I wanted to do with Only Death Can Save Us and it's what we're doing with Outliers. Yeah. Um, and you never know, one day they might touch. It's it's it, All things are possible. Um, but the point is, is that these are books that are dripping in our in our own um, love for the medium mm -hmm. yeah. that's born out of an age where comics were king. Absolutely. Um, and, 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 and so in some ways... Although the characterizations obviously haven't had 80 years, the presentation, the the love of the medium, that's had those. We've benefited from mm -hmm. the people that have gone before us. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, and and hopefully we can bring that to our readers, to, to our yeah. audiences, and they can feel by, by our, just by us doing what we're doing and having the inspiration we have, maybe we'll get them to feel the way we do about right. about the same books and about our books and uh, they can sit on a shelf with you know with with those other books um that's certainly the way i felt about only death can save us i wanted it to be that um when you got the book i'll stop it dave <laughs> um when you got the book you just like you, you felt wow this is something i want to keep this isn't yeah. just a comic. I, you know, Absolutely. obviously we're in the we're in the business of making comics, making stories, but at the same time, it's also we're in the crowdfunding world. And so instead of having that book come out in tr in in you know uh, weekly or monthly installments and then putting them together and you keeping that book and thinking, mm -hmm. wow, that's that's a lovely book. It's the other way round. Yeah. We're now giving you that gorgeous book. And then it yep. goes off to the weeklies or monthlies at a later date. Um, but you get that special book, and that's the one that, as a creator, we want you to keep and treasure and keep up on the bookshelf and hopefully have, you know, not necessarily it deserves it, but hopefully you'd want to put it next to the books that we all love, you know. Right. So uh, that's that's uh, that's what's important. And, yeah. and that's what's being pumped into into this stuff at the moment. So. Well said. So Happy Jam Jam asks, whose character is on screen at the moment? And this is Maria Santos, and she is a government liaison for The Outliers, which is the, the book that I'll be crowdfunding later this year, hopefully sometime around August or September. Uh, we'll see how things go. But uh, So she is a... Uh, a regular non superhuman uh, that was assigned to the outliers team. And she w was a former uh, FBI agent who got uh, basically promoted and transferred into uh, home, a higher level of uh, uh, what would you say? Um, I'll just say a higher level of clearance within the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, she still technically worked for the FBI, but she was on loan to DHS for various uh, reasons. And when the whole outliers phenomenon came about where people started popping up with superpowers, the U.S. government quickly formed some new agencies to uh, respond to this. And... Um, one of those was uh, the OIA, which is the Outlier Intelligence Agency. And they're an intelligence agency whose sole focus is trying to figure out 
you know, where these superpowers come from, why did they start showing up, uh, how are they tied to the 24-hour meteorite storm that happened a couple of years prior. Um, so she basically, and, and OIA um, is part of Department of Homeland Security, and so she basically was transferred over from DHS into OIA and, and more or less uh, she still reports to the, I would say the department of Homeland security is still paying her check, but her direct reports are in OIA and the facility that you guys are going to see in chapter two of our first book uh, is essentially a joint uh, DHS OIA, I guess, compound, you could call it. Uh, it's, it's like, it's basically a military base that was converted, uh, for the purposes of, uh, OIA, um, and DHS jointly coming up with the outliers team, uh, putting it together and the outliers live in and train out of that facility. And so Maria, is their government liaison. She makes sure that they are advised on government protocols when they're out in public. She's the one who runs interference for them with any law enforcement or other government agencies that they might encounter when they're out in the world doing their superhero stuff. And she also is their field supervisor and reports on their activities and makes assessments on their performance in the field and and their uh, interpersonal dynamics. And um, she's not really their boss, but she's almost some of the team members resent her because they they consider her to be a babysitter. And um, in, in some ways, that is true. Um, but she's she's a very capable person in her own right. She was very um, highly valued within the FBI and then in DHS when she went over there. And then now in OIA, she's a very, um, she's an overachiever and very driven uh, with her career. She basically has no personal life. And so she's got the support of her bosses. And if she wants to, she can make problems for the outliers. and we'll see that there are definitely some problems that she will be causing, uh, which will not be um, appreciated by the outliers. So uh, as far as she's concerned, she will be in the first book. We'll see her um, right at the beginning of volume one. And that's pretty much uh, the team. We've, we've covered... Uh, the saint, we have shown, uh, the saint is the leader of the team, uh, and the, the, I guess you would say the, the field commander, the team captain, um, we've got, uh, he, that is a guy called rough cut. He's a villain that's going to show up in chapter two, uh, along with, well, that's misperception. So she's one of the outliers. She can create illusions. Uh, this is Terrence Hightower, uh, also known as High T, and he ch- can transform into this giant behemoth. Um, but he's got some interesting limitations to his powers that you guys will see uh, in chapter one. Uh, this guy is called Night Falcon. He's kind of like a cross between Batman and Iron Man. He doesn't have any superhuman powers, but he does use a power suit that allows him to contend with superhumans. Uh, This is Minimart. He's a speedster whose body converts sugar uh, into energy that produces uh, the ability to move and to think, to process information at superhuman speed. This is Bombshell. She's another villain, and we'll be seeing her in Chapter 2. Uh, she has the the ability to make inanimate objects uh, explode. 
And then this guy is uh, named Dennis Vedmadenko. And he is a uh, the antagonist of chapter one. And he's got he was the subject of genetic experimentation in a secret uh, research facility over in Europe. And he escaped from there, immigrated to the US. Uh, he's in the country illegally and was displaying uh, outlier abilities. So the government uh, tried to bring him in. Uh, they failed miserably, so they called the outliers. And so in chapter one of uh, volume one, the outliers are on their first actual field mission. You know, tr they've been trained up, but they haven't actually done anything until we open in chapter one. And their mission is to capture and bring Dennis back to um, their headquarters so that the government can ascertain why he's in the country, how he um, how he got to, to have the powers that he's got. Don't give too much story away. No, no. <laughs> uh, how he got the powers that he's got. And um, so when the outliers um, come upon him, they think they're just going to you know, come across a regular guy with maybe some super strength. And they're shocked to find out that there's a lot more to him than meets the eye. So that, that image in the middle there is him in mid transformation uh, or the early stage of transformation, I guess. And then if you want to go to the next image. Oh, what? The, the bear? The bear, yeah. And then that's him fully transformed. Okay. Bear man. Yeah. So he's about 10 feet tall. Oh, Leroy, he does have a backstory. Um, they, all, they all have backstories. Uh, yeah. Joe, Joe, Joe fills me in on this stuff before I go away and draw it. Believe you me, he has put a lot of thought and effort into this. Yeah, I, so I'm, not, uh, I'm intentionally not giving away too much of it. Um, it th there will be... Um, uh, oh, he needs a new backstory. Leroy doesn't like the one he's got. Okay. Oh, no, no. Well, no, Leroy, no. You, you can you can make one up if you like. You, I, I, you know, I'd be fine if you want to say that uh, excessive finger sniffing led to this uh, <laughs> transformation that he goes through where he turns into a giant hairy beast. I, I like Chris Oak. Uh, he said it's like altered beast. I like that. Yeah, that's cool. yeah, yeah. Like that's that. a good. That's a good call. Yeah. Uh, it is similar to Altered Do Beast. Do you want to see the the sketch of page one? Yeah, let's let's show the people. Uh, so this is this is a uh, very this is the sketch that goes that happens before I do finish pencils, right? So uh, so it won't have like minor details on it. It'll, the faces would obviously change. And there'll be mm -hmm. there'll be amendments to positioning and to anatomy, but it's 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 the basic layout before we get there. So this is something that uh, Joe can edit and say, yeah, we're all in the right position. Go ahead, do the pencils. Yeah. So for people that uh, are not familiar with the details of how comics get made, this is, as Russ was saying, this would be what we call like a breakdown or a layout or a rough. And this is Russ working from a script or an outline that the writer would give him and he would come up with, you know, what he believes the, the writer is asking for. And it would be in this rough sketch sort of format. And then he would say, you know, it, how does this look? Is this what you're looking for? And then um, the, the, the editor or the writer would then, you know, talk. They go back and forth and they'd... Um, adjust whatever needs to be adjusted until they they decide that you know it's it, you can go ahead and do and do the final pencil work um george is asking if russ does all his work digitally uh george is do, uh russ is doing the pencils digitally and he's doing the inks traditionally so effectively so, yeah you, you get a traditional piece at the end of the day yeah um, because th it used to be the case that you actually inked over the original pencils back in the day, right? Um, so, uh, so there you go. There's a there's the cover from, funnily enough, from the Indie Revolt Revolt um, 
Arrow Comics book. So you can see what something looks like once it's been digitally printed out. Uh, me, digitally um, penciled and, and then... Um, let me uh, get you full screen there, Ross. Okay. Okay, go ahead and hold it up. So that's that's inked with brushes on a real piece of card. <laughs> so it's a bit shiny because it's in a it's in cellophane at the moment. But mm -hmm. so there you go. So yeah, it's it as far as I can for for me personally, it's the uh, it's the optimum way of doing it. Um, it's not quite as quick as as inking digitally. I'll be I'll be honest, it isn't. Uh, but then I'm hoping to get quicker. Uh, and that's all about practice. It's all about doing it and doing it. So uh, I used um, I used digital inks to get me to a point where I was happy with my style. It was all about style. It wasn't about the brushwork. Um, and uh, if, if I'd have had to, I'd have carried on being a digital inker. But tools have come on such a long way I, I was never great with a brush. I just get really messy, basically. Mm. Um, uh, but now the brush pens that I have are superb, and there's so much control in them. Uh, so I'm I'm now happily brushing uh, away, uh, doing traditional artwork. Um, so I get exactly what I want out of the pencils because it, I've said this before: it, it effectively layers in Photoshop or in uh, in clips in um, in paint. Uh, what is this? Clip Studio Paint, yes. <laughs> Excuse me, my Alzheimer's is ca catching up with me. Uh, Clip Studio Paint, it, all the layers are is just you at a light box, you know, photocopying, tracing, doing different pieces, uh, things with your own art. Um, and that takes forever. Whereas mm -hmm. digitally penciling them, I get to do stuff exactly the way I want it. Um, and it works and it's really quick. And then I can print it out. And, you know, if it cocks up, I can print it out again. Um, and uh, then I can use brushes over the top, so I kind of get the best of uh, of both of both worlds, hopefully. So, yeah. So this particular uh, page right here is what I'm calling a prologue page or a title page, and every chapter in the twelve chapter story arc will have one of these, which is basically if you could distill a 22 page story down into one image, what would it look like? And so the uh, chapter title will be there in the upper left corner. And then the credits will be down at the bottom. And here we see the outliers are working together as a team uh, to try and apprehend Dennis. And we've got the saint uh, who has just delivered a haymaker and is knocking Dennis back into next Tuesday. Uh, but the outliers will quickly discover that uh, Dennis has a lot more uh, to to bring against the group of them than they ever could have imagined, and they'll find themselves in trouble fairly quickly. And the title of the chapter is "Rookie Mistakes." It's it's a good story, from what I've seen so far and what we've discussed. I really enjoy it. So uh, hopefully you'll that'll come come through in the art. Um, I've been, I have worked on all kinds of stories and, uh, I can say that it really does make a difference if you're enjoying the story as you go along. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, it really does. I mean, the, the first graphic novel I did, which was, um, Terminus at Fenton's Green, I did actually really, I was really enjoying the story and I got it in pieces. So it was, it was set out to be, uh, three or four comics, I think, um, but I, I did the whole lot as a graphic novel, and uh, by the end of it, I was I, I kind of I was a little bit lost because I missed the characters that I was involved with, mm -hmm. um, and that that's what you as an artist, if somebody else is writing for you, that's where you that's where you'd like to be. Um, I don't know how invested the people that you know, like the artists that inspire me. I don't know how invested they were in the characters they drew. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I do know, for instance, that Busima loved Conan. He loved drawing Conan, and yeah. it, it's his finest work. I agree. Um, and and you can see some of that 
in Silver Surfer as well. Mm-hmm. He lo- he really enjoyed drawing Silver Surfer. Both of them complete fantasy. He hardly ever had to draw a car or a building. Yeah, it was it was all just it was rock and trees and people and dragons and and monsters and and that's what he loved doing. And you can see how much he loved that that work. So it does make a difference. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so Phil has asked a question: Do the outliers kill? And I will say they're not supposed to, but this is a new team and they are definitely going to make mistakes as we'll see in chapter one. Uh, Things will get pretty dicey in chapter one and they escalate from there. So uh, I'll say they're not supposed to kill, but they're essentially they're a essentially they're like a government task force for a combination of an intelligence agency and a law enforcement agency. So OIA, the Outliers Intelligence Agency, it's kind of like if you were to combine the FBI and the CIA and they only had one focus, which in this case is things that pertain to outliers, which are almost always outside of the scope of a typical law enforcement agency or a typical intelligence agency. So. Uh, this scope, this scope. Yeah. <laughs> we, we might be able to kill someone, but probably kill me drawing it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Jasper plan nine says 99 subscribers. Can we yeah. get one more? Get one more. Uh, if any, yeah. if yeah, if anybody ha- that's listening or or watching and has not uh, subscribed yet, if you're enjoying the show, we invite you to subscribe because we do the mm-hmm. show every week, uh, every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Although I have to say that uh, next week I might not be able to do the show. I've got a family member who's going in for some surgery, and I have to confirm. But I think that uh, I'm not going to be able to do the show next Thursday. So um, I'll I'll find out for sure, and then I'll let people know. And and if we don't, if we can't do the show on Thursday, then um, or if I can't, um, then I'll talk with Russ and see if he wouldn't mind hosting it on his channel. And if he wants to have a co-host, um, then we can set that up. If he wants to do solo, we can set that up. So oh. Whoa, look at that. Look at that. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate each and every one of you. I, I when I started this channel, I really didn't know what to expect. I really didn't know what would happen with it. Um I think that it's is it our fourth show? Yeah, I think so. Might be. Um yeah. So four four weeks, only doing one show per week, and we just cleared a hundred subscribers. That's great. Thank you very much, everybody. I really do appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Uh, I know that you could spend it doing anything else, but you choose to spend it with us. And Russ and I both are very grateful for that. Very much. And so. yeah. as we continue each week, we're really looking forward to showing you the artwork from Outliers showing you pages. You're going to get to see uh, Russ draw the book. Um, He'll be showing. Go ahead, Russ. So so I I may well be, I'm I'm planning to start uh, live streaming on a Monday night. Uh, So that will be late Monday night in the UK. So the early evening in the States. Um, So if you want to see what's going on and it will be a mixture, uh, I'm still having to do the odd, Bits and bit, bits and pieces outside of outliers, uh, but mo- you know, ninety percent of my time really is outliers stuff. Um, I obviously don't want to show too much of it either, uh, so I, you know, it's, it's nice to have something else to show people what's going on and what's happening on the drawing board, uh, right. and I'll chat to other people and what have you as well. Um, so there will there will be some streaming on my channel, and uh, just if you want to see process videos about outliers or anything else that I do. Uh, you can pick up channels or uh, pick up videos and watch them when you like. Um, Cause I, I put up process videos quite often uh, and that's over on my channel. And I'm very fortunate now to have had 
I've got 686 subscribers, which I'm absolutely chuffed with. So, um, yeah, if you want to uh, subscribe to that channel as well, and you'll, you'll be able to get the full gamut of, uh, of information about the outliers and the production. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the growth of this channel and your channel as we go into this year and we're, we're showing off pages. We're showing the production mm -hmm. process. I'm able to talk about story and character in detail. Um, believe me, you guys, I'm, I, when you think I'm giving away spoilers, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I save all the really good spoilery stuff for when you read the book. So, um, when we're, um, showing you pages, uh, in, in chapter one and, and there'll be a moment, I'm not going to give it away now, but there'll be a moment with high T where you're going, I can't believe he just spoiled it. <laughs> that that's only one of of the things in the book and i'm not i'm not going to be showing uh text i'm not going to be showing the lettering um online live um if eric weathers wants to do some stuff where he's lettering live um and, and he's working on outliers then i'll just I'll, I'll get with him and make sure that he's not lettering anything that's too spoilery uh, otherwise, I'm I'm more than happy to share every part of the production process with you guys that are interested in it. And uh, I promise you, I I will only save the truly spoilery stuff uh, for when you get the books and and the really uh, eye opening, jaw dropping moments will be uh, preserved for when you've got the book in your hands. In I I tried really hard to do that with only Death Can Save Us, and invariably you you don't have the time or the focus to be able to put everything on screen anyway. Um, you you want to show people. I wanted to show people the process of what happened with Only Death Can Save Us. And, and that there's a there's a, a, a playlist on, on my uh, channel. And I've got one more video to do, which is a, a, a debrief about what I learned from the campaign. Um, and then that's it. It's like a whole thing from the, from the script, through the thumbnails, through some of the artwork and breakdowns what have you but i still didn't get anywhere near the amount i wanted to on on film mm. um and it doesn't matter how hard you try you you know because you're focused on getting the book done at the end of the day you're focused on making it the, be the best you can and, and you're always going to forget to turn the camera on or you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're, you're always going to do something um but but yeah i i, I think the the idea that people can come along with you is is even it's buying more even more into the whole crowdfunding aspect that yeah. you bring an you bring people along with along with you to be an audience to feel like they're part of the process um even down to the fact that you know if you got people in the chat they might say something it might spur an idea yeah um, absolutely and and they feel like they're being part of it and um i think that's that's the future it's, it's the future of entertainment is yeah. audience interaction uh, because at the moment, entertainment is trying desperately to gatekeep the audience. Yeah, it's trying desperately to say, "You stay on that side, you you lowlings, you you yep. plebs, you're there, and you will get what we give you." Mm -hmm. and then and shut up and be happy about it, and and think projects like this are all about. What do you think? It doesn't doesn't mean that we're going to listen. <laughs> it's you know because at the end of the day, you have a creative vision and you want to bring that to fruition. But the fact that you that, that they're there, I shouldn't say listen. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to change anything. It doesn't mean yeah, we're going to use those ideas. Of course, we're going to listen. I was going to say, yeah. As a as a yeah. publisher, I'm definitely yeah. listening. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, it doesn't it doesn't mean that we're going to act on those things that we're being requested, right? But it certainly means that we listen to the intent. We listen to the 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 the, the um. You read the room, as it were, and see where the audience wants you to go. Um, and that's what the interaction is all about. Not just saying you don't get a choice. You don't get any interaction into this whatsoever. Yes, it's a creative vision, but at the same time, you want to provide something that people actually want. You, you don't just want to give them something and say, that's it. And, and that's, that's where I think this is. It's an evolution of entertainment where, especially with the crowdfunding aspect where people feel like they're being part of the, the, the concept, part of the whole yeah. 
um, production of of a piece, and and they have more invested in it because of it. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we're going to be doing before too long is when we get to the point where you're drawing chapter two, uh, I'm going to essentially let um, viewers and potential backers give me, uh, I'm, I'm going to throw out some ideas that I have for the name of chapter two. Uh, chapter one is called Rookie Mistakes. And um, the so chapter two, I, I do have a title in mind, but I've uh, decided that I want to uh, throw it out there to potential readers and um, ask them what they think it should be called. And if yeah. somebody out there comes up with something that you know the the majority of potential backers likes then, uh, you know, there's the option to use that and uh, maybe they'll even see their name in the book in the credits, you know, chapter two title by so-and-so. So, -and -so. so mm -hmm. I, I just, I love the, the idea of that kind of interactivity. Yeah, yeah, it really does. Yeah, it's, it's it, it, I just think it's the way forward. I think it's what people are, I def I definitely in comics, it's what people are hungry for because they're, they're fed up of being, um, Shoveled rubbish. Yeah. Johnny um, Rando's so. got one right there. Chapter two, the sophomore slump. <laughs> so I think that's it for us today. Again, everybody, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everybody who's subscribed to the channel. Thank you to everybody who has watched live or watched the replays. Uh, those of you who can't make it live, uh, we certainly appreciate you watching the show. Uh, on your own schedule when, whenever you can get to it. And I um, am really looking forward, as I was saying earlier, to showing you guys the production process. And hopefully you guys will feel uh, every bit as part of it as Russ and I are. So uh, thank you once again, everybody. And we hope you go out and make a great day. Yeah. Dazzle, Danya. <laughs>